Today, on the set of Miracles from Heaven. I was so moved by it. I just wanted to know more. Ephraim Graham speaks with the actors and the family behind the new movie. She completely engulfed herself in it. Plus, strung out on drugs. I was in torment. I was in total torment. And stricken with HIV. I just remember my life flashing before me. One addict comes clean on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this edition of the 700 Club. Are you as confused as I am about all of these delegates? How many delegates it takes? How many for each state? How much is proportional? How much is uh, uh, winner take all? Uh, how many you need? How many super delegates there are? I mean, it is so baffling. I think they set it up that way so nobody would know if he ever won it. <laughs> but anyhow, today, today, is the real Super Tuesday. And Donald Trump is moving to lock down the Republican nomination with victories in Ohio and Florida. But he's got tough competition in Ohio from Governor John Casey. Well, and Hillary Clinton is trying to hold off a challenge from Senator Bernie Sanders, who's been gaining on her in some states. Dale Hurd has this look at today's important primaries in the race for the White House. It's a day that could be the critical turning point in the race for president. Contest in five states, including the delegate-rich winner-take-all states of Florida and Ohio. This is a place I want to win. This is the place. This is going to do it. GOP frontrunner Donald Trump was in Ohio overnight attacking its governor and his rival John Kasich. The two are neck and neck in the polls there. Kasich cannot make America great again. Can't do it. If Trump loses Ohio, some experts think that when the Republicans meet in Cleveland, it could be a contested convention. If Kasich loses Ohio, he's likely out of the race. But the Stop Trump movement was in full effect. This country is not about us tearing one another down. Rivals spent Monday reminding voters of the recent violence at some of Trump's rallies. Look, a Bernie Sanders sign. Don't worry, you're not going to get beat up in my rally. One difference between this and a Donald Trump rally is I'm not asking anyone to punch you in the face. There's no violence. There's love fest. These are love fests. In Florida, Senator Marco Rubio is determined to claim victory in his winner-take-all home state, despite polling behind Donald Trump in some cases by more than 20 points. In Charlotte, North Carolina, Democratic frontrunner Hillary Clinton was blaming Trump for the violence at his rallies. I do call him responsible. I think if you go back now several months, he's been building this incitement. Clinton holds a wide lead in Florida and North Carolina, but recent polls show a tight race in Missouri and Sanders narrowing her advantage in Illinois and Ohio. Dale Hurd, CBN News. You know, that violence, I was listening uh, to one commentator who said that <clears throat> the violence, the one person who attacked, he tried to jump the fence and rush the stage, you remember? Mm -hmm. uh, he wasn't some uh, bystander who suddenly had been activated yeah. by Trump's rhetoric. He was a longtime leftist whose mother is a professional leftist agitator. And the whole question that we were dealing with was somebody who was a professional agitator. These aren't just people off the street who say, oh, I'm disturbed because of the rhetoric. And for Hillary Clinton to make like they, they were, that just is ingenuous, I think, don't you? Well, do you think, I, I mean, one has to wonder when you watch that, who, who sent or planted these people to create this kind of chaos? And is that out of fear for Trump's position? Well, who and knows? I mean, you'd think that the, uh, if the left thinks he's going to lose, then why do they attack him? Exactly. Um, and, uh, you know, it doesn't make any, any sense. But uh, the last thing that I can remember about really serious violence was in Chicago under Mayor Daley. Um, when there was an anti-war protest against Lyndon Johnson and, you know, all that went along there. Um, and there was violence. The police were throwing, you know, arresting people in hotel rooms and 
the demonstrators were throwing bags of urine at windows <laughs> on top of the police, and it was a bloody mess. So, uh, folks, uh, this is par for the course, but th th these are not uh, just peaceful people, just like the ones who went to Ferguson, Missouri. They were <clears throat> professional agitators. And you, you find uh, these black people from New York City going down to Missouri and then leading a, uh, a riot and then saying, well, look, it's petite police brutality we're concerned about. And so, well, uh, that isn't spontaneous. And it's, uh, you know, it's planned. And that's one of the keys of the left. You, you know, that, that's the playbook of uh, uh, the, the, the radical uh, uh, initiatives that have been followed out by Obama and the left. I mean, you know, they have a playbook. You know, here's what you do to, to take power. Well, and you just were talking about how confusing it is to people who don't know the behind the scenes That's aspect right. of it on top of all that you mentioned about the super delegates and all of that business. I mean, the whole thing is just well, you, crazy. You need to spend a lot of time thinking about it. And even if you have, you can't understand what's going on. Well, in other news, a surprising move by Russian leader Vladimir Putin. My guess is that he was running out of money and this is a face saving way because he can't stand the, the heat any longer. And he says, who needs Syria? I'm losing my shirt. But John Jessup has that story. Pat, President Putin has ordered the withdrawal of Russian military forces from Syria. The move comes before a new round of peace talks between Syria's President Bashar al-Assad and opposition forces. But Putin made clear Russia will maintain its naval facility, air base, and some troops in Syria after a nearly six-month campaign in that country. Although the withdrawal coincides with Syrian peace talks, the country remains deeply divided and terrorist groups are still fighting to take over the country, which today marks its fifth year of civil war. A top ISIS leader has died from wounds suffered in a U.S. airstrike in Syria. The Chechen terrorist Omar al-Shashani was easily recognized by his red beard. He was one of the more prominent Islamic State leaders, serving as the military commander in Syria. Despite some losses, ISIS still controls large amounts of land in both Syria and Iraq. Well, in Israel, Christian singer Pat Boone won an award for his impact on culture in Jerusalem for writing the title song to the 1960 epic film Exodus. Chris Mitchell explains the strong connection between the singer-songwriter and Israel. Some call the song Israel's second national anthem. This land is mine. God gave this land to me. It came out of the Bible. Yeah. And I knew two things. One, that everything in the Bible from beginning to end was written by Jews, about Jews, and for Jews. <laughs> not all Christians even realize that, and not all Jews. What we call the Old and the New Testaments, all are about Jews and about God's working with his chosen people. And that we Gentiles can get in on it if we accept the God of Israel. The Friends of Zion Award contains the song written in the shape of a harp, translated into Hebrew. Boone originally wrote the words on Christmas Eve on the back of a Christmas card. That card is now displayed in Israel's Holocaust Remembrance Museum in Jerusalem, Yad Vashem. I think this song, Exodus, and the privilege I had writing the words for Ernest Gold's great melody is uh, part of the most significant time in my life and maybe significant moments, maybe one of the main reasons I was born. Boone told CBN News that this honor is one of the highlights of his life. I can't imagine any other thing in my life other than my marriage and my own salvation that means as much as this. The Friends of Zion Museum here in Jerusalem honors Christian Zionists who gave their lives to save the Jewish people during the Holocaust and help form the State of Israel. Yeah. Chairman of the board, Yossi Pellet, is a retired IDF general and former government leader. Born in Belgium in 1941, a Christian family hid him to keep him safe. From the age of six months until he became eight years old, I was raised by a Christian family. And I was used to go to, to I went to, to church every Sunday and cross my cell and cross the bread before eating and uh, Pray to Jesus before going to bed. Pellet said he's proud to be part of the Friends of Zion vision. 
It's an, an outstanding vision about the history of this nation. The, not only the, the story, because nothing is new basically in the story, but it's new in the way it presented it. Until Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Pat Boone, a longtime friend of the 700 Club. Pat, back to you. Well, he's a dear friend of mine, and I, I'm just grateful for him. But that, that is, uh, you know, a great song. That movie, Exodus, <clears throat> was a stirring uh, film <clears throat> about the return of the Jewish people to Israel and the struggles they had to go through. And the theme song, This Land is Mine, uh, that was written so quickly by Pat Boone. But that, that, that may, you know, you do a lot of things in your life that stand out, and that may be one of his highlights. But he's a terrific friend, and he's a great friend of Israel. John. Pat, here at home, severe flooding is sweeping across the south, leaving people in parts of Mississippi concerned about their homes being flooded by quickly rising nearby lakes. And in Louisiana, flooding left more than 5,000 homes underwater. In some areas, it topped five feet above roadways. It's getting where it comes up so fast you can't prepare for it. It came up a couple feet just in a few hours. But between the floods and the hurricanes, uh, it's, it's been pretty rough. As the waters recede, residents are trying to get back into their homes. And Operation Blessing is there to help, assisting families with gutting homes, removing debris, restocking personal necessities, and serving hot meals from a mobile kitchen. Operation Blessing also has support teams providing emotional and spiritual support during this time of recovery. And Pat, I know that this, uh, this support is much appreciated by those in need. Well, I hope so. Um, I was down there after Katrina, and Operation Blessing just didn't fly in and, and take pictures and leave. I mean, they stayed and stayed and stayed. They were one of the first in and one of the last to go. And they've made a huge contribution uh, because of the, the suffering. Man, yeah. when I think of that Ninth Ward and what they went through, uh, the awful, awful, when the levees broke, the flooding, and now to see other people in Louisiana, but that, uh, uh, we've got some serious weather. I don't know if it has anything to do with global warming or what it is, but uh, there's, there's extreme flooding now in the, in the southeast. Yeah, those folks are made of strong stuff. Ooh, I mean, it's man. recovery, recovery, recovery. But they need a hand, and we're giving it to them, and thank God we were able to do that. All Indeed. Right. Well, up next, actress Jennifer Garner talks about her new movie, Miracles from Heaven. I didn't know if I could really just on a basic level believe the story. And at the same time, I was so moved by it. I just wanted to know more. We'll take you behind the scenes of the latest faith-based film, which opens tomorrow. We'll do all of that after this. Now you're watching the 700 Club. I'm so glad you're with us. We've got a good story for you now. This movie that's coming up uh, with uh, Jennifer Garner, tremendous movie uh, about a little girl, Annabelle Beam, <clears throat> diagnosed with an incurable disease. And then God healed her in an amazing way. And now her story is coming to the big screen in the film called Miracles from Heaven starring Jennifer Garner. Ephraim Graham brings us a behind-the-scenes look at this new film. Christy Beam watches closely as the pages of her book, Miracles from Heaven, come to life on this film set. This is the amazing story of her daughter, Annabelle's healing from an incurable, deadly digestive disorder. Sorry, we, um don't know what our schedule is going to be with the doctor. We just have to be available. Actress Jennifer Garner plays Christy, a role she personally calls transformative. My initial thoughts were I, I didn't know what to think. I didn't know if I could really just on a basic level believe the story. And at the same time, I was so moved by it. I just wanted to know more. Christy and her family watched Anna suffer through years of pain, invasive hospital tests and surgeries. Unable to do anything else, doctors sent Anna home to die. Then, despite the pain, 
One day she decided to climb a tree with her sisters. It was a hollow cottonwood and she fell inside 30 feet head first to the bottom. She was trapped, unreachable, unresponsive for hours until unexpectedly Anna woke up, walked away healed with a story of meeting Jesus in heaven. So you're telling me that when this baby girl fell 30 feet, she hit her head just right and it didn't kill her and it didn't paralyze her. It healed her. Yes. We watched the film with Anna and her family in Texas. Is what happened? Is it what you prayed for? I didn't exactly pray for it, but I just knew I was tired of dealing with it. And I didn't want to have to deal with it anymore, but I wasn't like, oh, I hope I fall in a tree and get healed. <laughs> Ready, and action. I love talking to people who can see their lives portrayed on the big screen, especially uh, when they have such great actors and actresses playing them. Oh, <laughs> she did an amazing job. She nailed it. And, you know, her heart was so in it from the very beginning. From the moment we met, we just bonded. Maybe as mothers, we just connected. And it just warmed my heart because she had my book and she was pouring over the pages. She'd highlighted things. She had questions for me about things. So she wanted, she completely engulfed herself in it. This is our fourth time here. This is an acid reflux. Her throat shot because she's been throwing up for weeks. Well, Mom, I'm the doctor, and that's my diagnosis. So if you'll excuse me, I have the patients I need to see. Excuse me, this is not acid reflux. She's not lactose intolerant. There's, there's something wrong with our little girl. Mrs. Beam, you need to calm no, down. No, you, you calm down. You find me another doctor, you run some more tests. I'm not leaving this hospital until I know what's wrong with my daughter. When you met Christy Beam finally and thought, I'm going to put this woman's life on screen, what did you think you had to bring to the table to make it happen? I, it was very, very important to me that we brought to the screen what I saw in real life, which was the enormous love between this family. And that we be allowed to let there be struggle within that love because that is part of real life. And you can't expect to go through something this huge without having moments of strife. Miracles from Heaven unites a familiar producing team, Bishop T.D. Jakes and former Sony executive Devon Franklin. They worked together on the film Heaven is for Real. I know you were looking for a follow-up to Heaven is for Real. Why was this the perfect story to do that? So funny because uh, the chairman of Sony at the time, Amy Pascal, had called and said, uh, you know, we need to do Heaven is for Real too. <laughs> <laughs> and literally like, it was like, yeah, well, Amy, you know, Colton came back, like he's cool, right? He's healed. And she's like, no, there's an audience out there that wants more content like this. And then immediately it was like, well, how do we do it? And his book agent, Jen Miller and Nina Madonia, had this book proposal called Three Miracles from Heaven. And the moment we had taken a look at it, it was a mother-daughter story. It was a mother fighting for the healing of her child. Uh, an amazing miracle happened. It was a page turner. And when you put that proposal down, it was clear. This was the movie to do. We know that Christy Beam is central to this story, but one of the things that really touched me was her husband, the gentleman playing her husband in the film. As a father and a husband, I could identify. And it's gonna be okay. It's probably just a bug. Doctor, give us something for it. I just feel anxious. About what? About everything, the kids, the house, your business. The kids, come on, the kids are fine. Mm. Well, my business is going to work. No, oh, baby, say that like it's absolute. Well, this may take a while. It'll be okay. It's a good life, Christy Bain. <laughs> what do you want men to take away from that? I mean, because I know turning to a wife was falling apart, trying to figure out how do I pull this together for you. Right, right. <laughs> I, I do too. <laughs> I do. Yes, I do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think, oh, yeah. first of all, you're one of the few people to ask that question. I think it's a great question to be asked. You would think with a female directress of the level that we had, and you would think with a female primary star of the level of mm -hmm. Jennifer uh, Garner, that, that it would be a chick flick. 
You know, everybody in it, it's a female story. It's about a mm -hmm. girl. It's about her mother. It was directed by a woman, but it is not a chick flick. No. It does not emasculate men in any way, nor does it uh, trivialize the masculine mm -hmm. role. He's mm -hmm. still strong. He's still Very relevant. So. He's still powerful. And I think men will enjoy this film because it is not just merely the dumbing down of the masculine role in the home. This is a story of hope from the heart to the heart. I want people to come away feeling hopeful, and I want people to come away and feel like they um, they are surrounded by miracles and they are surrounded by love, and sometimes you may have to dig them out. It's worth digging them out. It's worth taking the time to look around you and really find the own joy that, the joy that already exists in your life. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, Dallas, Texas. Hats off to the bishop, great guy, and uh, to be producing a show like this. And uh, I thank Jennifer Garner and her cast for the for a superb job. And I think you're going to enjoy. So you need to go see it. Uh, it's going to open in theaters tomorrow. That's Wednesday, March 16th, mm -hmm. and uh, it's available. So well, we've been talking about it for a while. So yeah. now. We get to see it. Okay, <laughs> Miracles good. from Heaven. That's yeah. tomorrow. Uh, we're going to have actually tomorrow an amazing interview with uh, Christy Beam, the real life mom played by Jennifer Garner in the movie. So be sure to join us for that. And up next, the story of another miracle, a patient who was healed of advanced HIV. Today, Michael is totally uh, HIV undetectable, and he has a perfectly normal immune system. Michael was an absolute miracle. He should, you know, he should be dead. But Michael's healing is not the most amazing transformation in his life. Stay tuned to see what is after this. Michael Canatello was given six months to live at the tender age of 26. Michael had congestive heart failure. He had liver failure. And worse of everything, he had advanced HIV. All the consequences of a drug-infused homosexual lifestyle. I remember not understanding what this feeling was. All of a sudden, I wanted to hide my body. All of a sudden, I didn't want to be seen by anybody. Um, all of a sudden, um, I went from this vibrant personality as a little boy to a very, very inward, depressed, dark state. Michael Canatello's parents didn't think twice when a pastor on staff at their church began to pay special attention to their seven-year-old son. I didn't understand what was happening. I, I, I uh, didn't understand what sex was all about. I didn't know. From that day forward, I remember like a blanket of shame coming over me. Michael's mother was debilitated by multiple sclerosis, and his father worked three jobs to provide for the family. Michael was ashamed to tell his parents what was happening, and the abuse continued. I felt inside we were doing the right thing by going to church as a little boy, but it was killing me. It was hurting me. It was destroying me inside. I never turned my back on God. I always believed in Him. I always knew He was real. But my view of Him became even worse because I said, if God would have allowed this, did He really love me? By the time Michael was 18, he had moved to California. He led two lives, one as a worship leader, the other as an active homosexual. I started to do things that I was very, very ashamed of visiting pornography shops and going into the booths and, and having sex with other men and privately behind, behind closed doors while I was in the church, while I was leading worship. Michael left the church and started frequenting gay clubs. There, he was introduced to cocaine. The very first time that I did cocaine, I said, oh, this is what it feels like to be normal. The shame lifted off of me. The, uh, the guilt lifted off of me. I felt a sense of euphoria. And the second that I put that drug in my body, I chased after it. While Michael's promiscuity continued, his drug use escalated to heroin and meth. Then in 1996, at the age of 26, he was diagnosed with HIV and given six months to live. I just remember my life flashing before me. And I just remember saying, God, is this how I'm gonna end up? I remember just weeping and I went into such a deep depression. But after that, I went deeper into drugs to try to alleviate the, t I was in torment. I was in total torment. Michael started hearing voices. 
He was diagnosed with schizophrenia and institutionalized. But among the hundreds of voices came a whisper of hope. I would hear that voice, which was the Lord speaking to me, Michael, this is all gonna turn around for you one day. One day you're gonna have a testimony. One day all this is gonna change. Michael was released from the mental hospital and his body began shutting down from the HIV and drug use. One night alone in his bedroom, he found himself in a physical and spiritual struggle for his life. I was shaking and, 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 and uh, just, I was sweating profusely and I cried out to God. And I said, Lord, I said, if you don't help me now, I said, I'm gonna die. I need your help. I need to heal from you. I need for you to speak to me and tell me what to do. Then God told him to open his Bible. And when I opened up the Word of God and read through Jeremiah 30, when I got to verse 17, that is what opened, it was like a light was shining on this one verse. And the verse said, I will heal you of your wounds and I will restore health back to your body. And when I read that scripture, it was immediately that life entered into my body. And I knew what he meant by healing me of my wounds. He was talking about the shame, the abuse, the torment, um, all of the, the mind maladies and all the things that had happened to me. That night, Michael recommitted his life to Christ and took the first step toward God's promise of healing. From that day forward, the Holy Spirit literally held my hand and walked me through a time of deliverance. Michael left the life of gay nightclubs and drugs. Soon after that experience, Michael came under the care of Dr. Douglas Walsh. At that time, Michael had been battling probably the worst addictions that I've seen in my history of medicine. He was having I mean, congestive heart failure. I mean, he was, so he was suffering from failure of his liver and his heart in very, very poor shape. His HIV was advanced. He had an extremely high viral load. His immune system was uh, just down in the, in, in the single digits. And we prayed together and we worked together and, and started our journey on, on getting his health better. As Michael grew spiritually, he began to heal physically. Today, Michael is totally uh, uh, HIV undetectable. In other words, he has no detectable virus in his system at the present time. And he has a perfectly normal immune system. Michael was an absolute miracle. He should, you know, he should be dead. And I tell him that oftentimes, you know, that God has a purpose for him. Michael lives out that purpose by teaching others through Lazarus Ministries in honor of the God who he believes raised him from the dead. Today, the only voice he hears is the voice of his Savior. He became everything to me that no one could ever become. He became my best friend. And in a matter of a, a, um, a couple of weeks, I was free from addictions that had me bound for decades. He was the one who restored me, and he was the one who put that satisfaction in my soul that I don't need men, I don't need money, I don't need sex, I don't need drugs to fulfill that inside of me. My fulfillment is in Jesus Christ. What a testimony. You know, the thing, what started him in his downward spiral is tragic in itself, a man of God a leader in the church, an ordained priest in the church, begins to molest this little boy who didn't know anything about what he was doing, and suddenly stirs within him this homosexual spirit, which led to guilt, which led to oppression, which led for a desire for release, which led in turn to cocaine, which led to all the rest of it. And then ultimately that horrible disease of HIV that settled upon him. And you know, they say there's no cure for HIV. There's some drugs that will tamp it down, but to be delivered where you don't have any trace of it in your body, that is an extraordinarily miracle, extraordinary miracle. But God did it. And now you've got a man who's on fire for Jesus Christ that only listens to his voice. And you say to yourself, why didn't God just throw him away? You know, look at this guy. I mean, he is a mess. He's diseased. He is uh, perverted. He's sickly. He's he's uh, terrible. He's you know down in the dumps. He's, he's beyond hope. 
That's not what God said, is it? God said, I love him. I love him, and I've got a plan for him. He belongs to me. And yes, he was damaged as a little boy. Beyond, it wasn't his fault, but he was damaged. And God says, I want to restore the damage. I'll take away the years that have been destroyed by the destroyer, and I will give him something better. What a testimony of God's grace. And if God can do that, he can do almost anything in your life. I shouldn't say almost anything. He can do anything in your life. So what do you need? You need, first of all, to do what Michael did and say, Lord, I, I'm, I'm yours. Now, would you pray with me at this moment? If you don't know him, God is a God of love. Bow your head and pray with me right now. Don't be afraid. Pray these words. Jesus, that's right. Jesus, thank you for what you did with Michael. Lord, I am amazed at the grace of God and the forgiveness of God and the healing power of God. Now, I ask that you'd come into my life Take over my life and set me free from that which binds me. I want to be free, Lord. Come into my heart and set me free. Thank you, Lord. I receive you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed with me, I want to give you something. We've had this available for some time. The Scripture doesn't get old. And uh, the Word of God is quick and powerful. Now, I have in my hand a little compact disc. It's called A New Day. It's about 73 minutes of comprehensive teaching about what you just did, of what all these things mean. And it's so easy. You're driving along with your car, and you slip that into the CD player, and you can listen to it while you're on the road, or you bring it home, whatever. And uh, we'll give this to you if you prayed with me. So I'm going to ask you to go to your telephone and call in and say, I prayed with Pat. I gave my heart to Jesus, and I'm free. And if you need further prayer or further miracle, somebody's on the phone who will pray with you. Whatever your need is, we're here because we love you. Terry? Well, still ahead, he was 16 years old when he came home from school to an empty apartment and discovered that his parents had abandoned him. Luis Reyes tells how he now rescues at-risk children. That's on today's 700 Club. We'll be back. Welcome back to the 700 Club. The House of Representatives has overwhelmingly approved a resolution that condemns ISIS's wide-scale murder of Christians and other minorities as genocide. The resolution passed 393 to 0. It puts more pressure on the Obama administration to formally make a genocide declaration against ISIS. Secretary of State John Kerry is reportedly leaning toward making that move. And we'll have an in-depth look at what such a declaration could mean on tomorrow's 700 Club. Franklin Graham has announced that an international summit on Christian persecution will be held in October in Moscow. The conference will draw attention to the attacks on believers in the Middle East. That's according to Premier, a Christian publication in the UK. Graham says the conference will bring delegates from around the world to hear firsthand reports about the suffering taking place in the Middle East and to pray for persecuted Christians. And you can find out more about this important conference and always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. To listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. 
When Pastor Luis Reyes began bringing street kids into his congregation, many people left the church. But that didn't stop him from reaching out to at-risk children in the same streets where he had grown up. Pastor Luis Reyes grew up in a poor family in Chicago. One day at 16, he came home from school to an empty house. His mother and stepfather had abandoned him. For the past 20 years, Louis has tried to bring hope to abandoned and abused kids. In the process, he's become a father figure to thousands. I started reaching 30 children in Waukegan on a Saturday at one o'clock in the afternoon. In his book, The Spirit and Power of Elijah, Louis says kids need a father's love and offers ideas to help men become better dads. Please welcome to the 700 Club, Louis Reyes. It's so good to have you here. It's good to be here. I'm really excited. Well, talk to me a little bit about your childhood because, you know, a lot of what God's called you to has yeah. come out of what you didn't have. Well, exactly. God, I really believe that God took my life as a young child and preserved me for this time to reach a generation. I really do. My childhood was very, very dysfunctional came from a very dysfunctional family. I didn't find out until later on in life that the man who actually raised me was not my biological father. Wow. He was a Puerto Rican man. Mm -hmm. And right before my mother passed away, she said, that was not your dad. Your dad was an African-American man, a black man. And it was at that time that I realized that this man that had raised me as, as his own son had loved me. And I believe that was where the heart yeah. of loving children that aren't mine, it came from him. It's so interesting how God uses all of these yeah. experiences in our lives for his glory, for the enlargement of his kingdom and for our healing yeah. in the process yeah. as well. When you were 16, yeah. you came home and you found a note that said, yeah go live with your friends in an empty apartment. I yeah. mean, here you are, your family left you. What did you think? Yeah, well, you know, because of all of the different drama that happened within my family and all of the different dysfunction, uh, my life was a life, Terry, where I was, I was trying to do things right within my life. Yeah. And I think it caused a lot of friction within my family and caused my family to be very broken. And uh, at some point in time, my mother and father felt it was best that they leave me behind wow. while they went on and moved to a different location. You know, a lot of people would have been destroyed by that, yeah. but you had something in you that caused you to rise up above it. Tell us, God also put you in a family that He, he did, the, the, the family that took me in, uh, I remember him saying, God took you, Louis, like Moses. He just protected yeah. you. And he protected you so that way you could reach a generation, you know, I, they, they mentioned a moment ago about the spirit and power of Elijah. It, it's my life. My, my life is where my heart was turned mm -hmm. toward children because so many people, so many people's hearts were turned toward me when I was growing up as a young yeah. man. Well, you know, the scripture says that in that day, the yeah. hearts of the children will be turned toward the fathers and yes. the fathers toward the children. Your yeah. book is called The Spirit and Power of Elijah. Yeah. God's obviously given you vision and passion for this. What are you seeing in the hearts of young people today? I wrote the book first off in 30 days. I wow. don't consider myself an author. I really don't. God said, write it. I believe the nation right now, the United States of America, we are primed to hear a message such as this, where the hearts of men are being turned back to this young generation. It's very, very important. And that's why I'm taking time just talking about this. Why? Because right now there's a shortage of fathers within our nation. And I'm challenging men not to just be men, but to step up and be fathers and spiritual fathers to this young generation. And it's a revelation that God gave me mm -hmm. out of reaching children now for 19 years. Yeah. Do you think do you think there's knowledge of how to do that? I mean, you can't really give away what you don't have, so. I'm glad you mentioned that. <laughs> I just ministered on Sunday morning that you don't need a certain gift, you don't need a certain anointing to be a dad. When you read in Malachi chapter four, five, and six, it says that fathers would turn their hearts yeah. back to the children. You need a heart. To be a good dad, you just need to love your children. Yeah. That doesn't take a certain type of gifting. It's not a special power from God. Mm -hmm. It's a heart issue. And that's what men need to know. I tell men this all the time. On your worst day, you're the best dad to your children. Boy, it's if you're so just true. There. I'm telling you, if he's just there, if he'll just turn Be his there. Heart. Yeah. <laughs> Be just there. turn your heart yeah. towards your child and love them yeah. for who they are. That'll make a big difference in the life of a child. We saw in that setup piece that, that ran 
all these kids who oh, are yeah. gathering and yeah. responding to yeah. your message. What are you seeing in them? Well, I see them that they want someone to love them. That's a big key. People always ask me, they say, well, tell me how the program works. Tell me how the program works. The program is great and you got to have structure and you got to have program. But the key element to, to, to me reaching kids, and I believe any church, any ministry, any man reaching out to young people, you got to love them and let them know that they love them. I tell people this all the time. I wasn't just a pastor to these kids. I was a father. Yeah. I provided for these kids. I started, a, I started a specific college just for children that grew up in my ministry, Terry. That would have never, ever gone to college. Wouldn't have even dreamt they it. They wouldn't have even dreamt it. Yeah. And we started that for them. We provide housing for these young people. We give them opportunity. That's what a father does when he loves yeah. his kids. You know, really, the, I've heard it said that a mother nurtures a child when yeah. they're young. But yeah. as they come into their yeah. preteen years, it's the father who yeah. calls forth the man and the woman that, yes, in he the does. child. It's, Not he, just boys. He calls, he calls forth the identity. Mm -hmm. It's the dad who's able to look into the depths of that child and say, this is who you are. This is what God created you to be. This is your purpose in life. Dads give identity to their kids. Yeah. And what I hear you saying is that you're not just reaching out to these young people. You're sending a powerful message oh, yeah. to men. Oh, yeah. Rise up. Oh, yeah. yeah. Be counted. Yes. Well, and that's, that's the thing. I, I don't have time to talk much about it now because it's in the book. But in the book, I define why God even said Elijah would return and turn the hearts of the fathers yeah. to the children. He was a child advocate. Elijah advocated for a young generation. And that's what men yeah. need to do today. Yeah. It's a it's an opportunity that could change the world that we live in. It surely could change oh, yes. the cities oh, yes. and our country in general yeah. here in the United it's, States. It's God's end time solution to a fatherless generation. That's what God intended. It's almost like God knew. Well, yeah. he did know. Didn't know. He <laughs> did know. He knew <laughs> that right now fatherlessness would be an epidemic in the United States and around the world. But with God, all things are possible. All things are possible. And so even as we're sharing this right now, yeah. I just want to say to you, Luis's book is called The Spirit and Power of Elijah. It's a message for you today. Fathers, husbands, men out there, find out how you can get a copy, copy of this by logging on to CBN.com because you can change the world yeah. by being there. Right. Yeah, it's a great message. Thank you so much for Thank being you so here. Much, for your Terry. work. I appreciate it. For Thank your you. work. Not easy. Yeah. Not easy. Yeah, well, we're going to keep it going, <laughs> yeah. though, for, for the Lord. Yes. Still to come, we've got your email questions lined up. Jennifer wants to know, when tithing, do you include income from child support? We'll let Pat answer that when we bring it on after this. Welcome back. You're watching the 700 Club. Alan Coleman is a freight broker. During the recession, his business could have taken a big hit, but it didn't. And he and his wife, Julie, know why. Alan and Julie Coleman have tithed faithfully their entire marriage, which has been over 30 years now. For them, it's about being obedient to God. No matter what, I tithe. It's, it's been consistent, 10%, boom. As a freight broker, Alan helps his customers find trucks to move their cargo. Even during the recession of 2008, Alan kept on trucking. When my business really took a dive because of the uh, market, we actually were still meeting every need. I never had to give up on our tithes and offerings. Every need was met, and we still feel it was because we tithed. They started watching the 700 Club in the 90s and became partners. When I see on CBN about them drilling wells in other countries, it just really warms my heart because um, I realize that people need water and it really bothers me to see them having to go and get water out of a pond or a, a hole in the ground. Alan and Julie teamed up with Operation Blessing and sponsored a well in India and another one in the Philippines. I'm just so amazed with for so little amount of how much we can help a whole entire family. Like we just watched last night one where they just brought a barbecue out so she can make tortillas and her son can now go back to school instead of babysitting. I mean, and just for a few dollars. Today, they still support the work of CBN and Operation Blessing. You can't outgive God. I mean, you just see so many blessings. What a wonderful couple. Mm -hmm. Folks, 
you know, CBN has got outreaches. Sometimes I don't find it myself. So I go to a board meeting, and all of a sudden I think, why are we doing that? Yeah, well, that's just one of the outreaches. We do things overseas and around the United States that you could not believe. And the outreach is so enormous, but at the same time, it's personal. It's family by family, poor person by poor person, orphan by orphan, and so forth. But digging wells so people can have clean water, providing food when they're starving, coming into disasters and helping with the relief of various kinds, uh, taking uh, gifts to little children during holidays. You go on and on and putting people into little, you know, private business like cooking tortillas. I mean, it's all there. And how can you have a part of it? $20 a month, 65 cents a day. That's all it takes. And, you, you know, there's so many things. I, I, I look at these things about uh, uh, Internet, and they say, well, you can get a complete hookup. It's only $60 a month. And you think, wow, yeah. that's $1,000 a year, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, think of what you could do to change the world. That's that. right. I mean, we're just talking about $20. So, folks, uh, if you're not a 700 Club member, be one. And if you already are, you can double and be a 700 Club Gold or something. But uh, please participate. And we will send you something that I think will bless you. We've got that movie coming up about heaven, uh, this child uh, fell down a tree and wound up having seen Jesus and also healed. But we'll give you this, people who've actually been to heaven, come back and talk about it. And uh, it's- this is, Can I tell you, this is Mary Beth. She lives in Hickson, Tennessee. She said, your heaven DVD was beautifully created. The messages and stories had me on the edge of my sofa. I could feel the peace they described because of the spirit within, and I rejoiced with them. I mean, that is a great DVD. Well, it, it is. We have Chauncey Crandall talking about people, is an eminent cardiologist whose patients, some of them have died, and he brought them back to life. Well, the Lord brought them back to life. Um, it'll all be there for you. But uh, more than anything, just call and say, you can count on me 65 cents a day. And I'm going to change the world with you. All right. Mm -hmm. Time to bring it on. And we were just speaking in that last video piece about tithing. This is from Jennifer Pat, who wants to know, when tithing, do you include income from child support? Uh, I've never faced that problem because I haven't had the child support I had to deal with. But if it's part of your income, uh, you probably want to do that. But mm -hmm. Again, you know, it's out of the abundance of your heart. We yeah. give because we love the Lord, not because there's some set rule that you've got to do it. But that's just a, a standard uh, that's been set over the years in the Bible. But uh, uh, I think it would be basically all your income and child support would be part of your income. All right. Okay, this is Thomas who says, I've had premonitions in the past that have come true. It's almost scary at times. The most recent event was asking my daughter on numerous occasions if she was pregnant. Each time I asked her, she acted as though I was crazy. Turns out she was pregnant and had not shared her secret. She was amazed that I knew and she was not even showing. Is this the Holy Spirit communicating with me? Oh, well, it could be at the same time you may be extraordinarily sensitive you know we give out am and fm radio mm -hmm. signals with our minds and uh, our spirits give out a signal to somebody else and for a mother with a child uh, you you know what's going on in that child's life so the fact that uh, she's pregnant you sense that as a loving parent a grandparent to be in a sense uh, is that some special gift? Well, it's it's something we all have if we if these were cultivated. Uh, so I, I think we ought to be more sensitive. But that doesn't mean that every time we hear some voice or some lady, we go off and do some crazy thing. Uh, it's reason of use. You, you know what they are. But at the same time, we need to be sensitive to the prompting of the spirit. And God is speaking. You, you know that song, turn your radio on your mouth. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, God is a, like a radio transmitter, you know, transmitting all the time. And we need to just turn on, turn tune, on. tune into the Lord. All right, what else? This is Chris who says, I'm always hanging around the wrong people and seem to get in trouble. I want to change and put my faith in the Lord. I have a son and one on the way. I want to give my life to God. What should I do? 
um, what you've got to do is to use the term man up. Uh, you know, the Bible says, gird up your loins. Sit down one day and look at yourself in the mirror and look at God and say, I'm not living the way I should and I want to straighten out. You have to make that decision and then day by day you start living it. That's what you have to do. Again, 21 days for a habit. 21 days to settle and, and you establish a habit. 21 days. That's all it takes. But if you'll be faithful in that time, uh, living for the Lord, good things will happen. Mm -hmm. Well, I thank you for those questions. I guess that's all the time. It is all the time, but we love hearing from you. So if you'd like right. to see some of those questions answered on this program, let we'll, us know. We'll Email us. Get on with the next program. We leave you with today's Power Minute from Psalm 119. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. Oh, how I love your law. Well, tomorrow, I meet the real life uh, mom that Jennifer Gardner plays in the new movie, Miracles from Heaven. And I think you'll find that inter interview very fascinating. Well, that's all the time we've got. So for Terry and Wendy and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Thanks so much for being with us, and we will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.